All right, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to uh, the Pitt Public Health Grand Rounds, um, where today we will be talking about revisiting Freedom House, a call for a modern and inclusive public health initiative. Uh, my name is Mario Brown. I am a uh, alumnus of uh, uh, the Graduate School of Public Health, and I currently serve as the director of the Office of Health Sciences, Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion in, within the schools of the health sciences. Um, and also as the interim uh, associate dean for equity, um, diversity, and, and justice in the School of Pharmacy. And so my role today is really just to introduce you to our dynamic panel. Um, this is really a, a wonderful event, and I'm so happy to be uh, a part of it. And so I'll get right to it because we would really want to hear from our panelists. We have a full, a full roster of panelists. So I want to first uh, do a brief introduction and then I'm gonna hand it over to my colleague, Antonio. Um, so first, I'd like to introduce you to Mr. Phil Hallen. Uh, Mr. Hallen is co-founder of Freedom House Enterprises Ambulance Service and President Emeritus of the Falk, uh, Falk Foundation. Uh, Mr. Hallen was involved in the foundation in its early uh, focus on social issues, including psychiatry and community mental health, as well as programs in community development, urban planning, public education, child development, expressive arts, therapies, and architecture. Uh, Mr. Howland served as a special consultant to the National Institute of Mental Health at the National Institutes of Health, with a visiting scholar, was a visiting scholar at the Institute of Medicine of the National Academy of Sciences, um, as well as at the Harvard Graduate School of Education. Um, and is an honorary fellow of the American Psychiatric Association. Uh, but most importantly, again, he was one of the co-founders of the Freedom House um, Ambulance Service. Next, we have Mr. Uh, Mitchell J. Brown. Councilman uh, Brown um, is a city council member and former, free, former Freedom House paramedics and Air Force veteran. Uh, Mr. Brown began his career as a paramedic a decade later, he took that same passion and commitment to excellence to Cleveland, Ohio, where he served as the commissioner for the emergency medical services in the Department of Public Safety. There, Mr. Brown developed and implemented the Paramedic Training Institute and created the Advanced Life Support Program. Mr. Brown became the city of Cleveland's director of the Department of Public Safety and was appointed director of the city of Columbus Department of Public Safety in April 2000 where he oversaw the operation of the Division of Police, Division of Fire, Division of Support Services, and as council member for the city of Columbus, Ohio, he uh, wears the public safety, he chairs the Public Safety and Veterans Affairs Committee. Um, and again, a former Freedom House paramedic. Mr. John Moon um, is the former Assistant Chief, City of Pittsburgh Bureau of uh, Emergency Medical Services, and is also a former Freedom House paramedic. Mr. Moon grew up in the Hill District, my neighborhood, uh, in the Hill District's Colwell Street and took a job as a hospital orderly. Later on, he completed his medic training at the North Park Fire Academy and joined Freedom House. For decades, Mr. Moon attempted to diversify the city of Pittsburgh's EMS workforce while facing steep resistance. She Next was, we have- She had time. Next, we have uh, Amiris, Amira Gilchrist. Amira Gilchrist, Mrs. Gilchrist, is the Deputy Chief of the City of Pittsburgh Bureau of uh, Emergency Medical Services, and she was hired as an emergency medical, emergency medical technician. She started from the bottom and climbed the ranks to become the first woman and first African American to hold the position of Deputy Chief in the Bureau of EMS in the City of Pittsburgh. Deputy Chief Gilchrist handles budgets, the vehicle fleet, complaints, grievances, and some special event planning, among a variety of other tasks. Born and raised on Pittsburgh's North Side and a graduate of Oliver High School, Deputy Chief Gilchrist enrolled in community college for her paramedic training and is completing her degree in public administration with an EMS concentration at Point Park University. Next, we have uh, my colleague, uh, Ms. Paula Davis. 
um, associate vice, Ms. Paula Davis is the associate vice chancellor for diversity, equity, and inclusion in the schools of the health sciences at the University of Pittsburgh. As associate vice chancellor for uh, DEI um, in the health sciences at Pitt, she coordinates the recruitment and retention of diversity fa of diverse faculty, students, and staff in the health sciences schools. She provides educa education on cultural competence, creating an inclusive environment, and eliminating structural and implicit bias. In addition, uh, her office, our office, aims to increase engagement among all health science stakeholders through a number of initiatives that examine the intersection of health sciences, racism, and marginalized populations. Um, and I will go on to say too that Ms. Davis has been awarded numerous uh, awards throughout her career. Um, she is also the pre vice president of the board of the Pfizer Foundation, vice president of the Greater Pittsburgh Higher Education Diversity Consortium, and advocates for autism research and education. Next, we have Dr. Sylvia Owusu Ansah, Anso, assistant professor of pediatrics, associate vice chair for uh, of diversity and inclusion, and pre-hospital emergency medical services medical director at the University of Pittsburgh Children's Hospital. She is also the, an assistant professor in the University of Pittsburgh School of Health and Rehab Sciences. She is the pediatric liaison for the division of EMS in the Department of Emergency Medicine. Dr. Awus, Awusu Ansa is a board certified pediatrician and board eligible pediatric emergency, emergency medicine and emergency medical physician. Uh, she has completed both a pediatric emergency medicine and emergency medical services fellowship. She develops curriculum and provides education for EMS personnel as well as for government EMS. Um, Dr. Owusu Ansaw uh, serves on many diversity, equity, and inclusion initiatives within the University of Pittsburgh and UPMC Medical Center. Next, we have Dr. Raquel Tripp. Dr. Tripp is the Vice Chair of Diversity and Inclusion for UPMC Medical Education. She is a Clinical Assistant Professor, Department of Emergency Medicine. Uh, she is in the Emergency Medical Services Medical, or she is the Emergency Medical Services Medical Director at Jefferson Hills, South Hills Region, Regional EMS. Um, she is also uh, works within the UPMC Pre-Hospital Command Physician for the UPMC Communication Center, um, among another, a number of other duties that she holds within the University of Pittsburgh Medical uh, School and UPMC. Uh, Dr. Tripp served as a flight surgeon for the United States Navy in Jacksonville, Florida. She completed her emergency medical residency at the University of Chicago, and she currently serves in the U.S. Navy Reserves. And she was also raised here in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Mr. Walt Stoy. Dr. Stoy is professor and the founding director of emergency medical of the emergency medical medicine program at the School of Health and Rehab Sciences at Pitt. Dr. Stoy was the founding director of education and international emergency medicine in the Center for Emergency Medicine. He remains director emeritus at the Center for Emergency Medicine Office of Education. Dr. Stoy is internationally renowned for his efforts in EMS and is recognized by his peers and colleagues as a groundbreaker and national leader in the field of EMS education. And next we have Dr. Dan Swayze. Dr. Swayze is the Vice President for Community Services for the UPMC Health Plan and the Director of Operations for UPMC Innovative Health Home Care Solutions. He is a widely considered pioneer in transforming our emergency medical systems to do better to address medical mental health, and social determinant needs. This transformation uses emergency medical personnel, known as community paramedics, to help vulnerable patients navigate to the appropriate system of care, rather than continuously relying on emergency departments to manage non-medical emergencies. Um, Dr. Swayze is the co-founder of the longest running community paramedic program in the country, known as the Connect Community Paramedic Program. And he is now leading several initiatives at UPMC Health Plan to further expand similar programs into communities across Pennsylvania. 
And last but certainly not least um, is Antonio Gumuccio. Antonio has served as an EMT for over 15 years and previously worked at UPMC MADCAR, coordinating the transfer of critical care patients to the University of Pittsburgh Medical Care Health System. A graduate of biomedical master's program at the University of Pittsburgh School of Medicine and is currently completing his master's of public health at the Graduate School of Public Health within BCHS. All right, I'm exhausted after, after reading those, uh, but I'm so happy that you all are here. And I'm now going to ask if uh, Mr. Gumuccio would please uh, take over and begin the program. Thank you, Mario. Uh, good morning, everyone. It's really an honor to share uh, the stage with such an accomplished uh, panel. I just wanted to give a little bit of the historical perspective and show a clip of what was going on in the time uh, during Freedom House. Just to remind our audience, this was in the um, in the mid 60s, uh, Vietnam was raging. There's a lot of social unrest um, due to racial division. Um, in 1962, tens of thousands of people were still dying in car accidents. And what prompted uh, the development of Freedom House was the National Academy of Science published what is now considered the accidental death and disability, the, ne the neglected disease of modern society, also known as the white paper. Many cities raced to take a uh, lead in this. Uh, many cities like Los Angeles, Seattle, Miami, they were at the forefront uh, developing important uh, practices and developments within what would become later on EMS. But first and foremost came Pittsburgh. And often it's re uh, forgotten, um, but what makes Freedom House unique is not only the important um, development that they had in terms of uh, establishing the guidelines for what would become modern EMS, but it was also a public health initiative addressing a severe health disparity at the time. In Pittsburgh, and typically all over the country, emergency runs were conducted by hearses, uh, run by funeral homes, or by the police, where a patient was picked up and was known as the, uh, the scoop, and they would swoop in and scoop a patient and remove them and rush them to the hospital not providing any sort of uh, care or very limited first aid care. And so Phil Hallen had the vision to see that there was work to be done here and specifically in the Hill District and coming in to develop this practice uh, and partnering and uh, Peter Saffer, who at the time was considered a giant medicine, uh, the father of CPR developing critical care and later on to be nominated for three uh, Nobel uh, prizes in medicine they came together and they thought this should come and be represented by the people that they're helping. And so to go into the Hill District and to hire um, young men, um, black men who were struggling to find jobs at the time, who were experiencing uh, a lot of social unrest. This was particularly highlighted in the riots after Martin Luther King had died. But prior to that, the training had already initiated with the help of Jim McCoy who was, a, uh, was part of the double, NAACP and a leader in the community. And between the three of them, they came together and organized what would become Freedom House. If we can play the clip, please.
Thank you, Joe. These men, um, at first, many of them were considered unemployable. Some came from difficult backgrounds, and not only were there veterans, but there are others who had uh, suffered from alcohol and, or drug abuse. Some had served time. Um, these men uh, received excellent training that many people thought they were not capable of understanding and would be a waste of time to invest in. Uh, they received remedial training to help them come and develop their skills in healthcare. At first, they received a lot of pushback from the society, but Pittsburgh learned to embrace them. Often in the most difficult cases, they would say, send Freedom House. And rather than expanding the program, the Mayor Flaherty at the time decided to institutionalize EMS as part of the city using police officers while admitting to absorb Freedom House, they quickly installed uh, difficult tests that they had to recertify and reprove and more than half of those original Freedom House uh, employees ended up losing their job and being phased out. Um, there are many heroes within Freedom House that we often forget. The development of the modern ambulance with Jerry Esposito, Don Benson, and Peter Saffer, uh, Nancy Caroline, who was uh, became the medical director as a resident, uh, went on to develop the paramedic uh, book that was used for many, many years. And many of them went on to very illustrious careers, while the men and later on women from Freedom House have often been forgotten. And so one of the challenges now is to preserve the legacy of Freedom House to make sure that they are remembered and honored for future generations as their labor helped establish and tested and improved many of what we use today and many of the protocols that we use today in EMS. Um, Mitchell Brown, uh, towards the end, uh, after 40,000 calls on 19, in October 15th, 1977, when Freedom House Enterprises Ambulance Service came to a close, over 40,000 calls had been delivered um, and answered. Many lives had been saved. He went on to say, we were the first. We developed a little known area, emergency ambulance care by trained technicians into a successful model, which has been copied by other municipalities across the country. We were good and the people, all the people came to recognize that fact. So I challenge us to preserve the legacy of Freedom House and not only use EMS as a way to address the social disparities that we, ex that we consider now and hopefully make them a thing of the past. Thank you. All right, thank you, Antonio, um, for that uh, background and for the, uh, that moving video. So now I'd like to ask Mr. Phil Hallen um, to just uh, share his experience of coming up with the Freedom House proposal um, and describe your experience of collaborating with Mr. McCoy, uh, Dr. Saffer, um, and to make Freedom House Ambulance a, a, a reality. Phil? Uh, okay, do I, what do I do? Just push the uh, share the share screen? How are, you, are you hearing me now? Uh, yes, sir, we hear you and we see you. Actually, Phil, you're on mute now. Push that uh, mic again. There you, there there you go. go. There you go. Okay. Um, I am uh, I'm so pleased to be able to uh, look back on, on this uh, 40 or almost, almost 50 year period of time, and uh, particularly to see people like you, Mario, who have been in, uh, in these trenches. Uh, at least half of that time, uh, and, uh, and of course, Mitch Brown and John Moon. It's a little you know, reunion for us, along with uh, Walt Stoy, who was uh, in the background pre preparing the actual track, which really brings us here today, which is to look at the future of EMS and EMS education. Uh, without Walt's uh, work in creating uh, the department, uh, we, uh, we would not be here today. So we have two, um, uh, actually three, uh, uh, tracks coming together here. One is, the, is of course, Walt's recent, more recent development of, of, of the program and the curriculum. 
uh, then the, the second one was the development of the uh, academic and medical and clinical component of Freedom House. And then the sort of the original one was the creation of the administrative structure and the sort of uh, business plan, which uh, uh, put these vehicles on the street, created a nonprofit corporation uh, in the uh, late, in the mid 60s, 66, uh, and became the platform upon which all of the uh, medical advances could be uh, carried out. And, and, and indeed, it was, quote, it was the vehicle uh, for these advances. Uh, so I, I just also want to say that uh, what I talk about uh, will be extremely brief. And uh, the people that really can tell the story of where things continued from when I, uh, as a foundation person, stepped aside are Mitchell Brown and uh, John Moon. So those guys, I'm gonna let them be the people that are on the, uh, the boots on the ground in this discussion at the beginning uh, and say that uh, I feel uh, sort of like a grandfather uh, in all this and looking at the, uh, uh, at the growth that's uh, taken place and that now uh, uh, being a, a proud grandfather, a proud father in a sense at the first, uh, moments of uh, Freedom House. I now uh, am a proud uh, great-grandfather, I suppose, of some of the ideas that are here. And um, I, I really want, uh, I, I, hope, I think that later on when we come back to some questions, I'd be uh, more than glad to, to uh, think about and reminisce a little bit on that. But I think the, the, the thing now is to uh, let the people that did the work that came into the that came early into the picture, and were on the ground, uh, taking all the the uh, the hits and the blows that came came along politically, uh, and while I uh, my role as the foundation uh, person continued uh, only in a kind of an observing and uh, an advocacy way, um, I uh, stepped back uh, from the original. And then uh, these guys uh, took the ball and brought us to where we are really at this very moment. So I'm going to let either Mitch or John, whoever's up next, uh, to uh, pick it up from there. And it's, a, it's a good to say to them both that, uh, that you know, a lifelong connection with uh, the two of you and uh, with Walt is one of the great satisfactions of my uh, foundation career. Excellent. Thank you so much, Mr. Howell. Um, so yeah, we will uh, ask uh, Councilman Brown or Mr. Moon. Uh, Councilman Brown, how about you uh, next? Tell us, to, uh, describe your experience of wanting to join Freedom House and how your role evolved within the organization. Well, I came to Freedom House um, Interestingly enough, and again, uh, all my references would be to Phil Hallen in a, a different sort of a way. Uh, I was a medic and served during the Vietnam War. And I learned about CPR, mouth to mouth resuscitation from Dr. Peter Saffer in books. When I came back home to Pittsburgh, uh, I also lived in the Hill District, grew up there. Uh, I went over to the University of Pittsburgh and I went to Dr. Saffer's office. And I'd seen these beige ambulances riding around, and I didn't know what they were. Uh, and I sat in his office, and Peter came out, and I asked him about the program, and he was telling me a little bit. And I said, well, I'm better than anybody you got. And he appreciated my arrogance, and then took me down to the ER and had me prove that I was as good as I said I was. And I was. Um, Working at Freedom House was a very interesting circumstance in a variety of different ways. Uh, and for me, the irony is that now I'm a city council member. Uh, when all during my years at Freedom House, we were battling the city administration uh, to try and not only survive, but to thrive and to grow, to become uh, what is now known the EMS system in the city of Pittsburgh. Uh, looking at those pictures bring back memories for me 
uh, Phil, you'll appreciate the fact of, you know, uh, Bob Zeffel and uh, Keys and uh, Ray Davis and Don Benson and all those folks uh, who all were very, very active and engaged in improving the way in which we delivered emergency medical care to the citizens of the city of, Cleveland, uh, city of Pittsburgh. Uh, we only served in the Hill District and downtown. Uh, and, and yet, yes, uh, our reputation grew uh, at being able to save lives. Um, Peter was a just an absolute taskmaster about uh, the level of skill and ability to do the job. Uh, and John will speak to the issue about uh, how he would teach you how to do tracheal intubation. Uh, in my case, uh, as well, John, I went to uh, the VA hospital at five o'clock in the morning and we go from patient to patient to patient and do intubation. Um, once he realized that I had the skills to do that, he left me alone and went to start dealing with other people. Uh, and the fun part about it was we didn't know we were making a difference. We just knew we were taking care of people. And of course, we had to deal with the racism and we had to deal with uh, all the activities associated with these group of young African-American men um, providing emergency medical care. Uh, I distinctly remember when Peter came to me and said, uh, we want to integrate uh, Freedom House. And I was a vehement, no, we don't need, we don't need any white folks. No, uh, the answer is very, very clear. And Peter said, Brown, we got to do this in order to get some money. And I said, oh, well, in that case, okay. Uh, and we uh, hired on our very first white person uh, by the name of Bill Rainovich, who went on and got his PhD in emergency medicine or in education. Uh, he te I think he retired from uh, teaching at Creighton. And uh, there's a lot of stuff to go on, so I can answer a whole bunch of things. But uh, the, when I'll kick it to John from the standpoint of uh, John will remember when I recruited him uh, at the uh, Presbyterian University Hospital. Uh, to come and be a part of Freedom House. Um, but, but we had fun. I enjoyed it. I, I, I will tell you quickly a brief story that Phil probably doesn't even remember or doesn't know about me. I graduated from uh, Fifth Avenue High School in 1965, uh, in June of 1965. My mother collapsed at home in August of 1965. I called the police. Two white police officers came to my home. Uh, they came upstairs. They found my mother, who I put on the sofa, uh, and they said she was drunk and they were not going to carry her to the stretcher or take her out to the paddy wagon. I said she was not drunk. She doesn't drink. They said, well, we don't care, and that's the way it's going to be. So I picked my mother up. I carried her down the stairs. I put her in the back of a paddy wagon and a canvas stretcher in the back of four holes on the floor. And we went over to West Penn Hospital where she laid in the hallway of West Penn for about 45 minutes to an hour. My mother died five days later from a cerebral hemorrhage. God in his or her infinite wisdom, when I went to the military, made me a medic. I, uh, we, do, we didn't agree a lot when God did that to me, but now here 40 something years later, almost 50 years later, and all the people that uh, I've had an opportunity to have an impact on uh, with regards to emergency medicine is attributed to people like Phil Howen, Dr. Peter Saffer, Don Benson. I recruited Nancy, uh, um, Caroline, great lady. Uh, and also, and Phil, you will appreciate this. I was on the phone yesterday uh, with um, Saul Edelstein. Uh, Saul Edelstein, Dr. Edelstein was the, again, one of the initiators of the Emergency Medical Services Operations Center. We call it MSOC. And then it became, again, while I was the administrative assistant there, the Center for Emergency Medicine. Uh, Walt can speak to that uh, and essentially how we began those issues. So uh, I came to being involved in emergency medicine in an interesting sort of a way. Uh, and all of the firefighters who, uh, here in Columbus, we have over 1,500. Uh, and know how I can be about emergency medicine uh, when they don't perform appropriately. But uh, we do a really fine job here. They did a fine job in Cleveland. Uh, so I've had uh, an interesting impact on a variety of different folks. So that being said, let me kick it back to you so uh, you can interview the, uh, my recruit there, uh, John Moon. 
Thank you very much. And thank you for that, that, that intro as a recruit. That gives us, I think I can listen to a, a whole fireside chat from you, Mr. Brown. And being a Shinley alumnus, I won't hold that archer blood against you. I, I understand perfectly. <laughs> we'll talk about that at a later time. Another time. Mr. Moon, please, uh, sir. I think my career kind of shaped in an unusual way. Um, I initially was an orderly at Montefiore Hospital. And um, I happened to run across two of Freedom House paramedics that uh, came to the hospital to transport a patient. And I looked at them and they conducted themselves in such a professional, authoritative manner. And it dawned on me that at that point, why couldn't I become that person? And these were two African-American uh, gentlemen. Um, and that piqued my interest. So I immediately found out where they came from and went to Presbyterian University Hospital and found out where the administrative offices were. And uh, actually, I made two trips to Freedom House. The first one, uh, I got there and was told that I was not qualified uh, to work there because they didn't have any pre-hospital care experience. So dejected as I was, I uh, left and uh, went and found out that I could gain that experience by going to an EMT course at North, North Park Fire Academy. 13 weeks, uh, I went twice a week. And once I uh, completed that, I returned back to Freedom House. And at that time, uh, Councilman Brown was in charge. And uh, once I showed him my certificates and credentials uh, from an EMT course, uh, he hired me immediately. So I owe a deep grit of gratitude to you, Mitch. And uh, I will always hold that near and dear to my heart that uh, you gave me the opportunity that uh, really lasted a lifetime. So thank you in advance for that. Uh, my career, at Freedom House was one of uh, proud, uh, compassion. Uh, I loved it. And um, it was one that I'll always uh, remember because Freedom House was the type of service that accepted anyone, uh, whether you were white or black. Uh, they definitely included you as part of their team. And one of the interesting things about that is, uh, I enjoyed uh, additional members that came along during their internships at Freedom House. And oftentimes they were white males. Um, one in particular was Bob Kennedy, who went on later to become uh, the chief of the city of Pittsburgh EMS. Uh, he did his internship under my uh, mentoring. And from that point on, he never forgot that. Uh, once we transitioned to, uh, the city, he kind of looked out for me. Uh, and I remember him mentioning at a banquet once he was leaving the city and going to the mayor's office that he knew what it felt like to be a minority. And uh, he would always be grateful to me for taking him under, his, under my wings and showing him how to be a more compassionate person as far as treating patients. Uh, so he kind of looked out for me uh, under those circumstances. Uh, I enjoyed my time at Freedom House. Unfortunately, Freedom House was absorbed by the city and that took an entirely different transitional formation for me. Uh, we came in uh, with uh, all this experience and none of it was accepted by the uh, administration of the in Pittsburgh Department of uh, Emergency Medical Services. Uh, we had to go through additional training and unfortunately, that kind of wore down on a great number of uh, Freedom House's uh, employees to the point that uh, they couldn't take it anymore and they were subsequently weeded out of the city's program. Uh, it became a survival of the fittest type of mentality. Um, and fortunately for me, I was determined to show that no matter what trial or what tribulation that came upon me, that I could overcome it. And as a result of that, I made myself a commitment that if I ever got in a position to make a change, uh, 
I was going to do that with the face of the city of Pittsburgh EMS. And as a result, I instituted the city's first diversity recruitment program back in 1990, which uh, needless to say was met with a great opposition, uh, both from the collective bargaining unit, from the field paramedics, from even uh, members of my own administration. Uh, what they did not know at the time is that the more resistance I came up against, the more determined I was. Uh, I ran into different problems, such as having my name with racial uh, discrimination carved into the uh, bathroom walls of different hospitals. Uh, it got so bad that uh, Chief Kennedy uh, sent a memorandum to the various emergency rooms uh, throughout the city region that any Pittsburgh EMS unit came in, they are, were to report to the bathroom to check to see if anything was carved into the walls and things. Uh, it was something that you couldn't just wipe off because it was carved into the doors. All of those things made me more determined uh, to achieve a goal of trying to change uh, the face of Pittsburgh EMS. And I made that commitment. And despite all of that right now, believe it or not, I still harbor a certain amount of love for that department, a certain amount of love for the people that work there. Um, and I'm actually very proud of that department for what it has accomplished. Uh, one of my greatest, proudest moments is to see uh, Deputy Chief Amir Gurikris uh, become Assistant Chief, become uh, Deputy Chief. Uh, and I have the utmost respect for her. And uh, she has my support uh, in anything that she come across. And the interesting thing about this is I can continue to ramble and ramble and ramble on about my career with the city. Uh, but I still love that department. I still love those guys. And I wish them nothing but the best. Uh, unfortunately, my retirement from that department did not go very well. Um, it was a forced settlement uh, as a result of being passed over for a promotion uh, to a white gentleman who I had been his boss for 15 years. And uh, subsequently, as a result of my filing the lawsuit of discrimination, uh, the settlement was that I leave. So as a result, uh, the mouthpiece of diversity left the city of Pittsburgh EMS and uh, I'm waiting on someone to pick up that mantle and to carry it on. And thanks very much for this opportunity. Oh, Mr. Moon, thank you so much. And uh, thank you for being a pioneer, someone that we all can, uh, whose shoulders we all still stand on. Um, and also for surfacing uh, the issues of, of racism and sexism that existed then and that still exists today. And as we transition and move forward in our discussion today, I'm certain that we will discuss some of that. Um, I'd like to circle back to, to, to you, Mr. Holland, and uh, ask you to talk a little bit about um, the ways that you were uh, looking to create a whole new emergency care um, and at the same time developing upward mobility for marginalized populations. Um, here in Pittsburgh, we could just say for black folk, uh, because Pittsburgh has traditionally been and continues to be a very black white uh, town. Um, but if you can talk about some of that and how uh, elaborate on that vision. The, uh, the idea that uh, uh, systemic racism uh, was, was throughout the entire medical care system was obvious to uh, almost everybody at the time, although very little was being done about it. Uh, and uh, Paula Davis knows better than I the, the struggles and the work that she did early in the early days of the, uh, uh, the shift in racial uh, uh, composition at the medical school in the 60s, uh, late 50s and early 60s. She was part of that. Uh, the one thing that the Falk Foundation kept on uh, doing after, after its initial support and creation of the Freedom House was to continuously work uh, with the medical school, with the School of Public Health, uh, to constantly press for uh, diversity and uh, admission and uh, creation of more opportunities for, 
uh, minority uh, members. That was absolutely part of our uh, mission at the foundation, and that's what I spent you know, the next 40 years of, uh, of my foundation career doing. Um, the fact of the matter is when, when this all started, I, I had no idea uh, where this would end. I had no idea that this would become um, a, a template for modern emergency medical training. It wasn't until uh, we, the, the, the fateful days which Jim McCoy and I uh, and, and others met with Peter Saffer to uh, put together his track of uh, training and creating uh, a whole new specialty in uh, emergency medicine and resuscitation with the, the, with the hopes and, and the ideas that we were uh, simply pushing forward to cr create more equitable service in uh, the Hill District. Little did we know that, that, that these, this combination of uh, uh, we had the bus, Peter had the gas, uh, was going to uh, uh, emerge as it, as it has over these uh, 50 some years. Um, my own experience uh, in terms of a, of a career track was, was, uh, was evident to me. That's one of the reasons I went to the keyboard uh, that, that day, the fateful day in 1965 or six, and uh, banged out this first memo, this first idea of doing this. And because during my own academic career at Syracuse, I had uh, my, my survival job for all that had been in the hospital. Cross serving hospital in the operating room and eventually in the uh, uh, in the ambulance running the uh, hospital's then private ambulance at least it was hospital a hospital based ambulance nobody knew very much at the time because there wasn't a specialty um, and uh, it was that it was that uh, that uh, experience that led me to uh, continue in the public health and taking uh, getting a degree in public health uh, later on from uh, from Yale University and and uh, getting into a career in philanthropy as as it relates to uh, the medical care the foundation the Falk Foundation in its early uh, iteration was known as the Falk Medical Fund and focused on uh, issues of, uh, of uh, equity and in uh, medical education, in both uh, in terms of the training of physicians and other uh, medical personnel, and the basically the beginning of our understanding of diversity uh, in uh, patient populations and how uh, this uh, affected the delivery of care, the quality of care, and had, had to be addressed. And the foundation, in later years, uh, began to focus on that area. So that's. That's that's kind of the trajectory that I uh, followed it during the, to, to answer your question. Thank you. Um, and Mr. Brown, uh, Councilman Brown, in in terms of being able to disseminate uh, with um, the work that you all did, the foundational work, and actually take it uh, even outside of Pittsburgh. Um, can you just talk a little bit about uh, some of the work that you've done in Ohio and the work you've been able to do to diversify the field of EMS? Well, I, I think it's important. When we did a transition from, the, from Freedom House to the city, uh, interesting story because unfortunately, uh, Mr. Glenn Cannon, who was the first EMS director, passed away earlier this year. Uh, obviously, I knew Glenn very, very well. He used to work for me. Uh, when he took over the city, uh, EMS division, they approached me about running and being the second in charge uh, for, uh, for the city. And I thought about it for a moment, and I thought, okay, it's the only way we're going to make sure that the other members of Freedom House are going to be treated fairly was for me to make sure I was there. Uh, I told Glenn yes, and he called me the next day and said, well, I don't think we can do that. I've talked to some people. How about we make you a crew chief? To which I said, no. Uh, and so I stayed at the university and we developed again MSOC, uh, Emergency Medical Service Operations Center, which again became the, uh, the parent to the Center for Emergency Medicine. 
I got recruited by Mayor Voinovich to uh, take on EMS in the city of Cleveland. Um, interesting circumstances there, uh, which I won't get into all the details with him, but uh, I told him no two or three times also because at the center we were about to embrace on a exchange program with London for physicians to come to Pittsburgh and we were going to send people there. And I thought, wow, here I am, a kid from Elmore Square in Pittsburgh, getting ready to go to London. Uh, even though I've been very blessed, uh, and Phil, you'll remember this. Um, in 1972, Peter asked me to help prepare a paper on recruiting uh, undereducated, underemployed people, and we went to Mainz, Germany. And uh, I uh, was like, uh, in 1972, um, the Steelers are playing, man. Really? What, what's wrong with you? We can't be going. And he was like beside himself. Uh, obviously, uh, I did go to Mainz, Germany. We did a fantastic job. Dr. Saffer, Dr. Eugene Nagel, who's down in Florida now, uh, Don Benson and myself. Um, but in Cleveland, we were experiencing the same kinds of things that were happening in Pittsburgh. And I think it's really important to acknowledge that back in the early 70s, and John will remember this, we were doing Narcan in the city of Pittsburgh uh, through, uh, and people had no idea what the hell we were doing. Uh, we were, uh, and at the time there was this tremendous heroin epidemic coming in from New York, and we were saving lives in the Hill District. We were saving black folks who had gotten involved in overdoses, but white folks were dying. And people couldn't understand what were we doing that they weren't doing. And the issue was that we were issuing Narcan. When I went to Cleveland, the objective was to put people in positions who had skills and knowledge, not unlike John Moon, um, in positions of responsibility. And we transformed it from a basic EMS system to an advanced life support system with paramedics doing uh, life-saving skills like tracheal intubation, Start doing IVs, uh, intravenous, and, and even though we didn't have the same kind of medical direction, uh, we had a lot more flexibility. Uh, so I got to do that there. Uh, my career took a change, however. Um, the mayor uh, in, in Cleveland asked me to take on public safety. Public safety was dramatically different because it involved dealing with the cops. And I was not thrilled about having to deal with the cops and I didn't know if I had the right temperament for dealing with the cops, to be quite honest. Um, and again, the irony of it all was that when I went to Cleveland, the fire chief there, and most of the folks who are involved in this kind of business know the fire chiefs are like uh, gods in their own right. I went to the fire chief and told him what we we're gonna do with EMS in Cleveland. And he said, we didn't need it. And I said, he said, I got the best people around. And again, my arrogance came out. I said, well, you call the best person you got because you're the chief and I know you can make him come here and I'll embarrass him or her uh, right in front of you, okay? I said, but this is what we're going to do with EMS and with the minorities and position of responsibility and authority. So uh, we had fun with that. And then when I became the director, obviously the chief of police and the chief of fire had to report to me. Um, it was challenging. Um, but the difference was that the mayor um, let me appoint the police chief. I told him I wouldn't take the job unless I could do that. If I could not appoint the police chief, I wasn't going to take on the gig. And he said I could. The police chief I appointed was a gentleman by the name of Howard Rudolph, who lives in Florida now, and we still talk uh, about different issues. Um, so, and the objective was, okay, let's try and work towards increasing diversity. Uh, within the police division and, of course, within the fire division. And I was able to do that uh, from my position as a safety director. Um, moving forward with my career, I did the exact same thing when I came down to uh, Columbus as a state uh, safety director. Uh, the, uh, in fact, unfortunately, the individual who was the lieutenant colonel for the state of Highway Patrol uh, just passed away a, a couple of days ago. Uh, an African-American, his name is uh, Gil Jones, a real pillar in regards to uh, uh, public safety, and I'm going to miss him a lot. Uh, so my career has been very, very diverse in a lot of ways, but it went towards being involved in control of the police. 
Um, and down here, for an example, in Columbus, our police officers carry Narcan. Uh, when I retired, uh, I was in the midst of making it happen. And then everyone said, well, it didn't. And then when I came back and as the council member, I said, oh, we're going to do this. And now, obviously, our police officers are carrying Narcan and are responsible for saving over 100 people since we've initiated it. So leadership, and Phil Hallen knows this, and so does John. And as I look at uh, Ms. Gilchrist, I'm looking forward to having an opportunity maybe to talk with her, uh, makes a difference. And it makes a difference on all levels. And as a legislator, obviously, I have a real strong sensitivity from the federal level uh, to the state level and to the local level with regards to appropriate diversity for making things happen. Uh, and that's happening all around this country. I mean, think about it. The young lady who was killed by the police, Breonna Taylor, was studying to be an EMT. EMTs didn't exist back in the 1970s. You were called an ambulance attendant. Um, we slowly changed the terminology when Dr. Caroline did uh, the famous orange book uh, in regards to emergency medicine. So, uh, but we got a long, long way to go still. Uh, but that doesn't mean we haven't gone very far because remember, recently we've lost three fire chiefs and police chiefs, all of whom were African-American, African-American females um, across this country. Um, so we, we got, we got work, work to do, but uh, I'm optimistic I always have been. Thank you, Councilman Brown. And, and I really thank uh, all three of you all for, for really establishing this the, the historical foundation for our for our discussion today and I think you've really set it up for me to move to um, to Chief uh, Gilchrist and I want to make sure I get some questions uh, to you all from uh, our audience as well so really this question was uh, directed to you Chief uh, Moon and to you uh, Councilman Brown however I really would like to uh, hear Chief Gilchrist um, chime in on this as well and the question is what are some of the perils of racism that you still see persisting in the delivery of emergency medical care to black people. It's in Pittsburgh, uh, but we'll say locally, but also in other places. And what should current providers look to in, uh, in terms of transforming the work now um, to really impact uh, racism as it per, uh, persists in terms of medical care, emergency medicine, and so I will, uh, if, if uh, I know Chief Moon and Councilman Brown said they would love to hear from you, uh, Chief Gilchrist. So if you would like to chime in on that. Hi. Hi, Mr. Moon. <laughs> um, before I answer that question, it, it was nice to see the progression of um, Mr. Brown, Mr. Moon, and then now me, because um, Mr. Moon was very instrumental in um, getting me to this place in Pittsburgh Emergency Medical Services. It's a long story and I know we're pressed for time so I won't bore you with the details but you, you know you're forever uh, within my heart so thank you very much. Um, to touch on the question what are uh, some of the perils of racism that I still see, I think the lack of understanding. Um, I have been out of the field for a while um, and I've tried to engage with the community, but I think it's the lack of understanding. We still as African Americans are looked at as though um, we're, we're, you know, we don't have pain, we don't, we don't suffer as much. And it's, it's, you can see it sometimes in the medical treatment, you know, they may not be given pain medication more you know readily or um so i mean and that, that that's a shame because it's like i think that's a, a a bias that is not really recognized um as far as our workforce the good thing is is that a lot of our workforce uh has li lived in the city i i didn't see this so much before with um, older medics, but the younger ones now are from the city. So they are used to urban life and they interact, I believe, with the public a lot better. Um, so those are uh, two of the things, if you know, if that sort of answers your question. Um, 
the second part of your question, I'm trying to, uh, can you uh, repeat the second half of your question? Uh, yes, uh, let's see here. Basically, um, how are these, are you still seeing these things play out today? Um, and even, I'll even uh, 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 go to this, uh, Amira. Um, there was a report um, in stats produced by Ohio State study um, that noted about, from the Ohio State study, um, about noticing changes in attitude and willingness to lack, uh, to address the lack of representation. And I don't know, are you familiar with, with that article? And, and, and if you want to speak to that in terms of addressing lack of representation and how that might even impact how we deal with discrimination still today. Oh, I think it's a huge determining factor of how we uh, deal with discrimination. I'm not familiar with that study. However, um, our department is not as diverse as it should be. I don't think any public safety entity is as diverse as it should be. And the reasoning for that is, is that we're not recruiting enough and we're not reaching that segment of the population that we are serving to let them know that they are capable of doing these jobs. I think that is the, uh, the thing that we're losing. Um, especially right now um, with COVID, I mean, that put a lot of things on hold, but you're not, we don't make a good enough effort to reach out to um, the inner city youth. We don't, I mean, we are predominantly going into their houses at times and providing them first line medical care where they wouldn't even get from a physician. So we, they have to have someone that's representative of them. And um, it, it, I cannot tell you how many times as a medic when I was um, working in the field, and even as a supervisor when I was in the field, and people were in awe because I was an African American and a woman actually doing the job because they don't think those opportunities are available for them. So. Thank you for that. So representation definitely matters. And, yeah. and uh, in some degrees, I think even more importantly, in terms of, of uh, representation of women, um, more so even than race. Uh, absolutely. Thank you for that. So I'd like to bring in Dr. Walt Stoy uh, into the conversation. Um, and uh, Dr. Stoy, can you describe some of the efforts at the Center of Emergency Medicine to diversify the student body? And what have been some of your uh, successes, some of your struggles, um, and some of the efforts that you're currently involved in? Well, thanks uh, for the question. Be before I answer the question, though, I, I have to go through <clears throat> a little bit of memory lane here as well. You know, Mitch and I hadn't seen each other here for about 45 years, so it was great to see him here and chat a little bit before we got underway. And that uh, to hear how we all interconnect over the decades has been very interesting. And, you know, um, John Moon, I guess, will recall that, you know, he talked about back in the 90s with, you know, with what he was attempting to do. And that uh, John <clears throat> can chime in as well that, you know, we, we worked with John and the others uh, once things got organized <clears throat> and offered uh, a program for the underserved, not once, but multiple times at the Center for Emergency Medicine. And that, uh, so it, uh, we had, I believe it was 20 or 25 students that uh, were paid uh, by the city while they were going through the program. And that it was a program just for them, separate from the other program we were doing at that time. Our, our goal has been over the, the decades is to integrate. So and as Mitch pointed out, you know, back when uh, Ron Stewart came to Pittsburgh in 1978 and, and took what Mitch had talked about and then created what, uh, Ron called the Center for Emergency Medicine, and uh, 77 through 81, I was a paramedic for the city of Pittsburgh. And what's interesting about that is, is uh, while I was a, a paramedic for the city, uh, John Moon, uh, Gene Keys, uh, Irv Davis, uh, to name but a few, were the supervisory level 
people. And uh, my history and knowledge of EMS uh, was sitting at the table at the various stations chatting with them over the years I was with them to find out, you know, what the real roots were of how EMS had come to be. Because, uh, you know, I came to Pittsburgh from 60 miles south of uh, Pittsburgh, where, you know, I funeral home based EMS was all there really was. And so um, the Center for Emergency Medicine, you know, we ran our first paramedic program uh, when I was hired uh, by Ron Stewart back in 81, 82 with 20 individuals. And over the years, we grew to the point where in our heyday, I point out, we were running three programs a year with 40 students in each class, which was way too much. Uh, <clears throat> and in following in Nancy Caroline's footsteps, uh, with what she had done with the paramedic curriculum, the 15 modules uh, back then, uh, I was asked by the, the federal government to be the principal investigator and project director over all the EMS curriculum projects in the 1990s. <coughs> and it was during that time that, you know, we re-altered how things were done. And so we went back to just one program a year uh, with uh, greater detail on how we were doing it. And it, in 1998, it became uh, we created the bachelor's degree in emergency medicine at the University of Pittsburgh. Prior to that, it was all just through UPMC, the Center for Emergency Medicine, but we've still, and, and my original ties were to Pitt, were in the School of Medicine, and then transferred over in 98 to the School of Health Reb Sciences. So our, our diversity of the body of the students is really predicated upon the, the students who apply to the program, and I agree with the conversations now and some of the conversations we were having yesterday, what we really need to do is explore methodologies on how we go out and interact uh, with the individuals at a younger age and establish the foundation to do that. Uh, again, 60 miles south from here is where I'm from is Greene County, a little place called Carmichael's. Most people can't even find when they really even look on the map. But over the last uh, several years, I've, I've been invited by them to go down and chat with them about healthcare overall. I go down representing our entire school of uh, the School of Health Rehab Sciences, but predominantly with the emphasis for me being emergency medicine, but I'll talk to them about PT, OT, PA, whatever they like to talk about. And I think we've got to f explore methodologies on how we can find us that are willing and able to go to those institutions. Uh, hopefully invited to come and go to those institutions and sit with the students and interact with them. I've gone to two different schools uh, there to do that. Uh, and I think we've got to explore ways to capture and keep the folks interested in EMS versus the other areas. Over the years, it was many years ago, some of you may recall Peabody uh, with uh, Plunkett had a program. And I think there was somebody there probably before Plunkett uh, who was running a program for fire police and EMS. And I think if we were to talk to those individuals again, uh, what we, we may well find is, is although they hear about all three, that there's more money to be made by becoming a police officer or a firefighter versus EMS. And that in some regards, they view it as just being an easier event to get into. And that that's a question I guess you've got for me as well, as far as, you know, current challenges. And, you know, as far as the current challenges is still the wages that all EMS providers are paid. And so given the opportunity, particularly if when you look at EMS being either public health, public safety, doesn't matter, the wages aren't always uh, what they need to be. And so individuals won't go there. Uh, perhaps for some to a fire-based EMS service in Florida or California and such, they benefit that around here doesn't, really always uh, work out. And that as long as they have to work, you know, multiple jobs in order to make ends meet, uh, they're going to look for occupations and move into areas that will afford them the ability to do more. What's interesting about our degree program that we've had up for 20 plus years is, is that, uh, it, and Amara may be able to chime in on this, I know that, you know, the, the, the various chiefs and others that have been at Pittsburgh EMS, they have benefited greatly, I believe, by having our graduates who go work uh, with Pittsburgh EMS. Uh, but they don't work there very long, do they, Amara? They, they show up and they're there 18 months, maybe, uh, two years tops, and then they move on to other areas. They go become PAs, they go to med school, they go to nursing, they go to other things. Now, personally for me, I say on behalf of the University of Pittsburgh and School of Health Rehab Sciences, there's a great benefit in that, that their foundation is and their roots are EMS, which isn't a bad thing, and they go on to other areas of healthcare. Uh, 
most of you will not know the name Muhammad Hagamed, who just sent me several emails this morning, who's come back to Pittsburgh from Texas, who was an undergraduate student in the emergency medicine program and uh, went to school out in Philadelphia. Uh, but prior to going to medical school, was a paramedic for the city of Pittsburgh. And while in medical school, would always come back to Pittsburgh to hang out uh, with the paramedics and would always stop and see me. He was fortunate enough to get into our residency at the University of Pittsburgh in the Department of Emergency Medicine. And I would see uh, Muhammad usually every Thursday for grand rounds. And we would sit in our off my office and chat. And I the note this morning I sent to him states that I'm truly delighted he's back and that look forward to sitting around and chatting about whatever it's going to be. And from what I understand, I believe it's no secret, he's, he's going to be the associate medical director of the undergraduate degree in emergency medicine. Uh, as the Owen trainer who's been with us for many, many years, uh, will still be around for uh, whatever duration he wants. But it's, it's always time as well to look for appropriate succession planning. And so uh, I think we've, we've tried to contribute as best we can, and there's so much more we can and should be doing. And I'm glad we're having this conversation and I'm, I'm delighted to see all the questions that are coming through as well. Sorry for taking so much time. Oh, thank you so much for that, uh, Dr. Stoy. And, and actually I'd like to, before I, I go deeper into sort of the diversity and inclusion uh, portion of our talk with some of our other uh, colleagues, I just want to circle back a little bit uh, because both you and, and, uh, uh, Chief Gilchrist really touched on some things, and Councilman Brown talked about in the early days of, of being able to provide Narcan, and um, and both he and Chief Moon talked about getting involved in this because they just had a passion to serve people in the community, in their own community, where people were not being served. Um, and you talked a little bit about methodologies. So there is a question in the Q and A where uh, uh, someone is asking. Um, is it required for EMS workers to be trained on mental health issues? And I think that really gets at some of even some of the societal things that we're seeing in terms of the way uh, first responders are responding to certain communities and in certain communities with uh, very bad outcomes. Um, so what is some of the EMS, and I'll just pose this to anyone that wants to answer, uh, maybe Dr. Story or, or Chief Gilchrist, but some of the issues um, in terms of training, especially around mental health and crisis uh, calls. Um, I, I, the unfortunate thing is, is paramedic school. Um, it is, you know, it's educational, but a lot of it is experiential. Um, and the unfortunate thing is, is that mental health is briefly touched on in some of the modules that you go in um, into paramedic school as well as you know with the continuing education sometimes is brought up but i do not think that there's enough mental health training for ems providers or public safety as a whole i myself um, have a special needs son he's 26 now and I'm fortunate enough with the resources that I have for me to provide the care that he needs. The unfortunate thing is, is that I do also think if he was left out to his own devices and was run ac come across by somebody in uh, like police or EMS and they didn't understand what was going on with him, they wouldn't be able to properly care for him or treat him. So that is a huge thing that we're lacking in emergency medical services is the mental health aspect. And I haven't had a course that delves deep into that. So, so I'll chime in on this as well. I agree uh, with the uh, mayor hundred percent. So, we, we spend too much time on the hard sciences. And again, and with what we do at Pitt, on the Pitt side, the majority of our students appear to be headed to PA. Next are headed to med school, next are nursing. And therefore they need to cover all of that in their first two years. And during the senior year, the additional credits that are hanging out there, that's what they wanna cover with that. Ever since creating the program, my comment had been, had given truly the way I would have loved to create the program, that you would add to have nine or 12 credits of or psychology and nine or 12 credits of sociology to get to us. Uh, I think it would be a better well-rounded individual. Unfortunately, the, 
it can't be designed that way. And within the curriculum, curriculum itself, both the EMT, paramedic level, advanced EMT, take your pick, there is not, and I will say it twice, there is not enough information for what we need to have there. And you have to realize as well, back when I did the first curriculum project in uh, 93, you have every organization out there saying why they need to have more hours of a, the program. The pediatric folks will tell you why the 110 hour EMT program should be 110 hours of pediatrics. So, you know, pick whatever specialty you want, everybody wants it. But I can tell you what we've dropped the ball on, what we need to continue to explore making modifications to is uh, the, men the mental health attribute because the majority of the patients that we go to take care of uh, are not, you know, trauma and their medical may well just be a an imbalance with what's going on or behavioral issues or other events that our out of hospital personnel need more depth and breadth of information on how to address those needs. If I may. Also, yes, in Columbus, if I may, we're doing, uh, well, we have a program, for crisis intervention teams, where we teach our police officers, uh, which is absolutely critical, more so than EMS, because part of that goes to how the calls come into the 911 centers. They come in and they're nondescript, so the first thing they end up doing is saying the person's acting out, so they send the cops. The cops get there, and they have to make a determination as to whether whether or not they should intervene or whether or not they need EMS to respond. In our case here in Columbus, we have our police, our fire division is, Ronsalt also does EMS. And we have a division called, a component called Rapid Response Emergency Addiction Crisis Team, REACT. Uh, and they have the opportunity to have access to social workers to try and minimize uh, possibly incarceration, but get them the kind of help and care that they need. Um, and we're looking to expand the crisis intervention training for our police officers, again, because they're the ones who are going to get the calls on the first uh, line, and then also educating our 911 call takers and dispatchers. Well, I'll tee the ball up for Dan Swayze, you know, whenever you get to him, that, you know, uh, the Connect Project and community paramedicine is what we need to move into with all of our EMS providers. Uh, several years ago, in conjunction with Dan and a few of the individuals to work with him uh, at Connect at the time. Uh, we've also added classes within our senior year that are the community paramedic side of the programming because the EMS side of pre-hospital care is just that emergency event. But the community paramedic side is more of, I think, what we need to be inclined to teach incorporated within the program somehow. It's just there's not enough time to do it. But as far as con ed for EMS providers, they should be going to the community paramedic classes to learn how to, to interview patients in a different format and address their needs in a significantly different way. Excellent. And, and actually, Dr. Story, great minds think alike. Uh, yours being great minds just average. However, I was really to pivot uh, to and bring in some of our other uh, speakers, specifically uh, Dr. Swayze and Associate Vice Chancellor Davis. Um, we definitely have some questions around training, but before we go there, I really wanted to get at this um, issue of um, not just uh, uh, being able to deal with behavioral and mental health issues in community, but even as providers and looking at the training there um, when it comes to being able to recognize bias um, and things of that nature. So first, Dan, I would, since Dr. Story uh, teed it up for you, ask you to talk a little bit about uh, some of the work that you are doing with Connect. Um, and then um, I would uh, ask uh, uh, Associate Vice Chancellor Davis uh, to chime in as well. Thanks, Mario. And, uh, and it's great to see you, by the way. And likewise, <laughs> friend. Uh, it, it, I just want to comment as well as Walt and everybody. I'm just amazed at the, the pioneers and the legacy. When you talk about standing on the shoulders of giants with where we are today, we have the giants and this virtual chat, it's just amazing to hear the stories. The unfortunate part for us is a lot of the challenges they faced 50 years ago are challenges that we currently face or have even become worse despite their pioneering efforts. Um, so to, to piggyback off a of Walt, I think the dirty little secret in EMS today as it has evolved is it's really the only form of universal health care that we have. And a lot of times, and I'd say that it, without exaggeration, 
about 80% of the calls that our medics are dealing with now are not for the life or limb threatening emergencies that Mitch and John were responding to back in the 60s. People call 911 because they don't know who else to call. They call because they have some uh, barrier to not only healthcare, but they have housing issues or they're socially isolated or they have food insecurity issues but we don't have an immediate response to any other system of care like they all have helped us build into the healthcare system. And so as a result, we feed them in the most expensive restaurant, we house them in the most expensive housing that we have in this country, and that's to be found in the hospital and in the emergency departments. And so to piggyback off of what Walt was saying and what's been alluded to is when mental health, which is one of those social determinant of health issues that we need to face, is encountered in a 911, as it often is, we need to give tomorrow's workforce more tools in their toolbox than just taking the person to the emergency department because that's not the source of definitive care for these kind of crises. We need to figure out a way to get patients that are struggling with opioid use disorder into the right recovery system of care or connected to the harm recovery or harm reduction services that are available to them. We need people that are struggling with food to have access to food without having to go to the hospital for it and, and really recognize that EMS uniquely is positioned to respond and navigate people to those different systems of care. And that's what we've been trying to build for the past 15 years in our community paramedic project. We have natural helpers. We have people that are willing to work two and three jobs oftentimes to be available to people in their moment of crisis but we've misled them a little bit into believing that every time somebody calls for an ambulance, they need medical care and really equip those future providers to be able to deal with the situation kind of an all hazards approach is the term they use in public safety. I don't care what you're dealing with, whether it's a mental health crisis, a medical emergency or a food emergency, you've called the right number, we'll help you get to the right system of care without assuming they all need to go to the emergency department. And I'm hopeful that future iterations will follow the stuff that Walt and company have done at the Center for Emergency Medicine, where we really start to recognize that the ability to assess and address the social determinative health issues will be a core competency of all of our EMTs and paramedics in the future. Yes, excellent, Dad. Thank you for that. And, you know, you just brought, made me think uh, about some of the connectors to, you know, we talk a lot about social determinants of health, but we talk less about um, social determinants of, 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 of equity. Um, and oftentimes, uh, when we think about the way mental health is talked about in our society, it, it's talked in, in terms of some deficit model. Um, but also, uh, uh, Ms. Gilchrist, uh, uh, Chief Gilchrist talked about even having resources, she still worries about um, her son and interacting with. Um, with our first responder system. Uh, so I would like to ask uh, 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 Paula, if you could speak to some of, um, some of those equity issues and what do we need to be looking at to make sure that um, our, our responses are equitable? Um, and yeah, what, what could we do there? What can we do in that area? I think a lot goes to, uh, to education. So uh, Dr. Stoy's, uh, you know, wish that we had the capacity to require folks going into uh, service areas and, and to EMS in particular to take psychology and sociology and anthropology courses so that's of culture and how and why people's neighborhoods are structured the way they are. Um, and why we are lacking, or particular neighborhoods are lacking in basics, um, why there are food deserts, why there are housing inequities. Um, opportunity to teach people about the history of the way this country has been structured so that they, they can understand why they are the way they are today. Um, and then teach them broadly about the resources that are available so that if no one is bleeding or in pain, but they happen to need another resource, then I'll first direct them appropriately. Um, just as Chief Gilchrist, I also have a 26-year-old son um, who's on the autism spectrum, and I spend a lot of time in crisis intervention courses with police officers 
and trying to get them to think about the other resources that are available in town as opposed to grabbing someone who's appear, who appears to be in mental distress, putting them in handcuffs, putting them in the back, taking them to a police station when there are clearly other needs uh, that, that they have. Uh, so we are we are we're missing the boat, I think, in in education, in teaching our first responders uh, about people and about life, um, and having them recognize uh, not everyone has the same resources available to them, and and um, uh, I think we are putting we may be putting them out there into communities. Uh, not as are as well armed as they could be uh, to address the needs of our neighborhoods. Thank you, uh, Paula. And, and yes, uh, that was just what I was hoping you would hit on too, in terms of the historical structuring of our of our communities, um, and understanding that um, folks are dealing with a whole lot of stressors, not just the very immediate one that they may be calling for help for, right? Um, so I'd like to ask Dr. Dr. Tripp um, uh, to, to maybe talk a little bit about how um, EMS and public health uh, is often overlooked. Uh, because some of what we're talking about now, we're sort of moving from just specific uh, uh, incidents or needs to a more of a global uh, approach, right? To more of a public health approach. Um, when we begin to talk about communities, and structures and systemic racism that, that's been talked about. Um, so is there a space to transform EMS education, uh, EMT or paramedic skill sets to function not only as a medical component, but more of a, a public health approach? Uh, thank you for uh, the excellent question. And um, and I don't know if uh, Chief Moon remembers me, but um, I was the uh, the first black uh, woman fellow for University of Pittsburgh. And I remember going to an MDOC meeting and uh, meeting you for the first time. So I just wanted to uh, say, you know, for my, my legacy. Um, now, in regards to the question, I definitely think there is um, truly important of having EMS, having that bridging with public health. So one of the things that you'll especially notice, and I know uh, was in Dan was talking about was when we get a lot of 911 calls, you'll notice that actually you get a lot of frequent calls from the same address. So when I am with my fellows and I'm, and I'm, on, and I'm on the Jeep and I'm going to these houses, I'll find a lot of the paramedics are basically familiar with those patients. They're like, oh, I remember I, you know, I went over to the house like two weeks ago for a 911 call and you know what, like this person's looking really bad. So they'll call us to ask about you know, can you please persuade this person, typically in refusals or non-transports, and they'll ask the doctor to come onto the scene to help convincing a patient that it is truly necessary for you to go to the hospital. And I will say that there definitely has been a higher uh, incidence, uh, at least I can say anecdotally for myself, and then, um, you know, Deputy Chief uh, Amara, she can talk more about it if she would like. But I have seen a lot of extra steps from our paramedics and EMTs with trying to call the person's primary care doctor, calling family, calling the doc to get advocates to recognize that. Because I would say, especially with COVID-19 um, pandemic, a lot of people have had, I would say, misconceptions that when they're going to the emergency department, they're going to catch COVID-19. And without recognizing that we have a lot of infrastructure and um, a lot of policies to separate our patients that we have a suspicion for COVID-19 versus those that we don't. So in most of the instances that people have um, contracted COVID-19 from the research from CDC has not been from the hospital. It's been from outside areas, public areas. So when people are calling 911 and they're saying, I don't want to go, like I remember I had an instance where I had a woman who had COPD and she was having exacerbation and she required oxygen, which she did not have there at home uh, was some, and she required nebulizer treatments and all she could keep saying is that I don't want to go to the hospital I don't want to get COVID-19 and you know and having myself talk with her getting her husband to understand I'm talking with the husband and even with the paramedics on scene we were able to convince her and reassure her that you're in a life-threatening situation that right now your imminent danger is that you're not going to be able to breathe 
and that you're going to die and phrasing that to people so that they're understanding that. So I will say that for the, on the EMS side, we definitely have a great responsibility of doing health literacy and education. So I would definitely come on to scene. There's multiple bags of medication everywhere within the house. And some people, because they're on so many medications, they don't realize which one is the most important. So um, paramedics have definitely been doing some teaching of like, you know, of medications and that knowledge of that. So we definitely done that a lot with in our EMS system too. Um, I will say that when it comes to disparities in healthcare, um, that one of the things on the EMS side we can do, especially with the research that has looked at disparities with pain management with adults and with children, that we can do more of a protocolization. So if there is a person that is having, and not just from a pain scale, so there's definitely differences in a pain scale of looking at a numerical scale, looking at a facies scale, or just basically having the interpretation that this is what the patient is saying and providing something. Thing. So there's definitely different ways of treating pain where you could use a non steroidal you can use like Tylenol, Toradol, or you go to something that's narcotic, but at least you're addressing the pain in some way. And I think from the EMS aspect, sometimes there is a implicit bias or even an, even an explicit bias where they may think the person is drug seeking um, without recognizing that this person actually truly has a fracture. Um, even though they may have an addiction to drugs, but however, they do have a solidified pathological issue of why that's causing that pain and you know and there shouldn't be a you know I don't want to give them any pain medications because I don't think that they're you know they're right and I just don't think that you know as a EMS when someone is calling for 911 that we should be judging a person based upon their previous history absolutely thank you thank you so much for that um, the, wow so much there to um, that we can unpack I mean so much you know, I mean, uh, you know, we talk about um, education right now. Uh, I know uh, working in the diversity and inclusion space in our schools and health sciences and really everyone really trying to seriously take an anti-racist uh, approach and lens to how we are educating um, the next generation of health professionals. Right. And, and that really gets it so much. So I, I'd like to ask uh, Dr. Sylvia. Awusu and Sue to join that, uh, this conversation also, especially around that area of, of the importance of education. Um, I mean, everyone has talked about it. Paula just introduced it. Uh, Dr. Tripp just introduced it. But what can we do? And what is the role of uh, that? What is the role of a diversity officer, um, both in the on the education side, but also on the practice side as well? What you know, talk to us a little bit about that. Great. Well, thank you, Mario, so much. And uh, Councilman Brown, Chief Moon, Mr. Halen, just want to say I'm truly, truly honored. I'm going to loop in my legacy to this. The One of the reasons why I got the job at Pittsburgh is because I wrote about Freedom House and I wrote about Dr. Safer and I was coming from Baltimore from Hopkins. So I connected Hopkins, Dr. Safer, Freedom House, EMS, being black, coming to Pittsburgh to make a difference. And here we all are. So just wanted to put that out there. So thank you. I can't thank you enough um, for, for being our shoulders. Um, so yes, education. I, I do want to point out, so um, I have the wonderful opportunity to teach uh, Pittsburgh EMS our pediatric aspect of pre-hospital medicine. And I'm doing that right now, uh, PALS and PEP. Um, some are familiar with those courses. And I do want to point out that it was a Caucasian male who came up to me and said, Dr. O, I want to hear more about social determinants of health and how we can help our underserved population. So I love to give credit where credit is due. I, I mean, he, I mean, that really, that really got to me. I was like, I should be the one, right, bringing that forth. Um, but that, that goes to tell you where we are right now. In society that people people want to know now majority not there's going to be a, a slight few that you know they're just not interested they will never be interested but we have the audience so with that being said um the importance of educating i think it's important for us as leaders in ems whether that be um ems trainers you know educators physicians ems medical directors clinicians or fellow paramedics as this paramedic taught me schooled me right 
um, to do simple things to educate our EMS providers on social determinants of health. So one thing that I did was add just a few slides. So many times we get the education and it's very homogeneous. It's the same type of population that we talk about. It's the same issues. Um, what I have elicited now is that, you know, race is a part of social determinants of health, not because of a biological construct, not because that's biologically how we've been wired, which has been the misinterpretation for the past 400 years of the United States history and, and, and what we've been deemed a society to think, but um, because of all the aspects of social determinants of health, whether that be social economic status, education, we talked about mental health. I also bring think it's it's important to bring clearly your patient to life through education. So another thing I talk about is that African American children are seven times more likely to come to the emergency department for asthma exacerbation and five times more likely to die from asthma than their Caucasian counterparts. So I think it's important to educate our EMS providers on these stats as Dr. Tripp elicited with pain medication. So that when you see that seven-year-old asthmatic in the Hill District that you've got the 10th call for, that you know has been intubated 10 times, you don't just throw albuterol and ipratropium on them. You really seriously think about the repercussions to come for this child based on social determinants of health, based on what we understand and know about the likelihood of this child's survival. So with that particular child, knowing what you know about health disparities, as EMS providers, we can act upon that to save lives. And I've seen that with Pittsburgh EMS. We had a young uh, five-year-old African-American female that they put on CPAP right away. And guess what? For the first time ever, that young lady did not end up in the ICU. And I 100% credit our EMS providers for that. So I feel like there are simple things that we could do within in, in the educational realm to let our, our EMS personnel know that they, they can help their patients, even in that short period of time, with a little bit of knowledge outside of just the hardcore medical facts, outside of knowing that, you know, oh, the kid is wheezing and they need albuterol. You know, take a little bigger picture of what's going on, as Dr. Tripp elicited earlier with the, with the 911 calls that keep going to the same house and kind of scratch our heads and ask ourselves why. And what um, Mr. Swayze alluded to as well, the food security, all these holistic approaches. You go to the house of a five-year-old asthmatic and there's, there's cockroaches and there's mold and we know that triggers asthma and that, that's an asthmatic patient. What can we do to help either from a mobile integrated health standpoint or, or hands-on, like the example I gave of using positive pressure right away in a kid who in a very sick asthmatic who has repeat hospital visits. So I think there are simple things that we can do on the educational realm. Um, the other thing that was pointed out to me is we, we get the same pictures, right? When we do these PowerPoints, they're the same type of slides. And this very astute paramedic, you know, asked me, how do I determine if a brown person is pale? How do I determine if a brown person is cyanotic or has, has a Lyme target lesion, right? I mean, we are, you know, endemic to Lyme disease and 26% of our population is African American. So how do, how do we cater to our population that way? So that was also brought to my attention. So I've been more cognizant of that. And I think that has made a difference to, to bring to light all of the patients that we serve and educate our EMS providers on all aspects of those patients. For instance, Latinx children are the number one ethnic group to uh, experience the most med medication errors, probably secondary to language barriers. So these are, these are very simple things that we can add to our educational curriculum that it, it ends up being a part of it, right? Um, all of us here have stories of the, of, you know, mass trousers and, and into, you know, into, whether to intubate or use a superglottic airway, and I'm using all these technical terms, um, but the key is eventually it was integrated into our curriculum and then it just became a part of what we, we do. And so, you know, I encourage that, that the same for um, our diverse populations to just integrate it into our curriculum and that, let that just be what we do. Um, diversity officers is an, is an interesting thing, but it's not new. I mean, we're doing it in the academic world, right? We're having our vice chairs of diversity and our chairs of diversity and our officers of diversity, why not extend that into the EMS realm? So Louisiana, again, another first, has a very prominent, a good friend of ours, uh, Dr. Emily Nichols, 
African-American female um, who is the chief of EMS, the EMS medical director down there. Um, and the joke on that with me was when she told me she was the EMS medical director of New Orleans, she goes to show my own prejudice. Um, I said, you mean of what parish? I'm like the whole New Orleans, New Orleans, or just, cause it was just hard for me to imagine that there's this black female EMS medical director. Um, but that shows where we are, right? So they are, they have diversity officers. And so diversity officers are people from diverse backgrounds, not just black and white, um, who are in charge of instituting uh, diverse curriculums in the way of implicit bias, anti-racism, um, means of diverse um, curriculums, like I, like I talked about, integrating all of those things. So having an assigned person to do a lot of the things that you know Freedom House did, Chief Moon did, Councilman Brown did in, in, in Ohio, um, and integrating that into the EMS agency. But by having an officer, it makes a statement to say that this, this to us is a need, this to us is intentional. Um, diversity is something that, that we want, that we want to uh, be a part of and that we want to change. Um, and so having somebody assigned to that, I think, um, makes a difference. Um, so Louisiana is one to look to that that has is a great example of that. So hopefully in my long-winded fashion, I answered both of your questions. Actually, that was that was excellent. No, thank you very much. And I don't know, I know uh, I, I want to ask uh, Associate Vice Chancellor uh, um, Paula Davis if she would like to add on uh, to that because you have been working intricately with all six of our schools with the diversity officers in all of the schools and just give us uh, some of your insight there. I, I would like to, uh, what Dr. Wusu-Ansa has said is that appointing a diversity officer does make a statement that our organization is paying attention to diversity issues and that their intention to make sure that uh, that all groups are, are seen and and acknowledged. Um, and treat it appropriately. Um, but what I really wanted to talk about today is accountability. Um, it's great to have a diversity officer, but we have to look at the org that allow the perpetuation of the inequities that happen in our organizations to the treatment of our patients. Uh, we have to look at how power is located in departments and divisions and who has uh, the final say and whether there are opportunities for equity uh, in those organizations. Fond of saying, unless you act with intent, you've done nothing. Uh, so we have to look at those structures. We uh, make sure that uh, we're doing equity assessments to make sure that um, can be treated appropriately in all processes, whether that's hiring or retention um, and also, again, it, it, it trickles down to uh, the way that our, our patients are treated. Are we paying attention to, uh, to curricula to make sure that our, uh, the, fo the folks that we're training have the, the proper information or the information that we want them to have in order to be uh, the providers that we expect them to be? Uh, so uh, accountability, I, th I think, is, is key um, to uh, you know, figure out what role they can play in um, adjusting the you know, systemic structures um, so that we have an opportunity to be anti-racist organizations um, and professionals. Thank you very much uh, for that, Paula. So I want, I want to try to circle us back and, and bring us uh, in our uh, closing uh, minutes here back to sort of where we began. So I'm going to ask you, Dan, um, pose a question to you, and this actually gets at a couple of the questions in terms of training um, that have been asked in the Q&A. And that is, I believe uh, Dr. Owusu said that, that there isn't really anything new under the sun. You know, what uh, uh, Phil and Mitchell and, and uh, Mr. Brown have done, you know, did uh, was, was pioneering work. But sometimes we need to come back to where we began. So do you think there, that there, is, um, there could be a, a Freedom House 2.0 uh, 
Um, is there a way that we can um, begin to go back into community, begin to use community as a pipeline? We know that uh, when it comes to community partnerships, uh, the community is expert in what they need. Um, so do you see maybe there's an opportunity um, for us to uh, go back uh, and, and bring back some of the things that we were able to do to get us to the point we are now to move us to the next level? <coughs> Boy, I sure hope so, is the short answer. Uh, I think what we're planning on doing in the future is trying to go back to the model that Phil and Councilman Brown and John created for us, and that is really trying to recruit a workforce into EMS that is understands what their folks are going to. And I think uh, Ricky and Amira both alluded to the fact that, and certainly it's consistent with our experience with our community paramedics, the people who serve best in that role are the people who come from share, some shared life experience of the patients that they're serving that can really empathize at a personal level what that individual is going through. And when you look at the nature of 911 responses today, we're not all asthmatics, we're not all diabetics, but it helps if I have that shared experience from a medical perspective. But the unfortunate thing is we've got a lot of paramedics out there that can understand what, it like, what it's like to be low income because a lot of them are struggling to make ends meet. I think what we need to do as the leaders of EMS in, the, in uh, trying to figure out how to recruit future generations is to identify people that have an issue that, that come from those communities that we're serving, any marginalized community, and say, we want you to consider a pathway that you may not currently think is open to you. And let me show you examples like Amara, who has come from the same community that you came from, that whether she likes it or not, she is the next generation's role model. Uh, she is the John Moon to future medics to say, look, there's, there's a path forward here that I can see in you that you may not be able to see in yourself. And it's dependent on us that are currently overseeing the, the systems to go find those candidates, whether they come from those low-income communities, whether they've been displaced from COVID and never thought they'd be interested in healthcare, uh, whether they don't think they'd be interested in, in uh, working in EMS because they have a misperception about what that involves, really trying to do a better job at promoting the realism that comes with EMS, the opportunities to help other people in their community that comes from there, and but giving them a broader tool set than we've done. It's not gonna be found in your first in bag. It's not gonna be found just by administering oxygen well. We really want you to understand all of the different tools that we can bring to bear now to help people that grew up in a neighborhood near you uh, and, and help them navigate to the right system of care. And I'm, I'm very hopeful that that model is one that we're gonna be able to pilot here in the next year or so to go back to our roots with Freedom House find a way to recruit students from those communities and give them the new version of EMS training uh, based on the, the pathway that all of our pioneers on the call here today led for us. Excellent. So, you know, I, I think what I'd like to do is just build off of that for all of you, for each panelist and, and give you all really in these uh, um, next 15 minutes uh, that we have to really speak to What's next? You know, we've talked about uh, what we've done, um, where we're at now, and where we would like to go. Um, what do you, which, what do you all have as visions for what we need to be doing and what we should be focusing on moving forward? And what I'll do, I'll start with uh, with uh, Councilman Brown, and I'm going to work my way through my screens up top. I think you're on mute, uh, Councilman. Uh, going into the future is significant in a variety of different ways. You had to understand your past in order to go to the future. Educating and finding individuals who want to pursue the aspects of emergency medical care. Now, in my case, it's law enforcement, firefighting, all those areas that impact on the community to improve on their quality of life. They do exist. And it's not about, I will tell you very, very candidly, I was always offended when folks said we were undereducated uh, when we took over Freedom House. We weren't undereducated, we just didn't have the opportunities. Uh, when we finally got the opportunities, look what we were able to do. I think for all those moving into the future, 
have to look towards the fact that yes, where you find them, educate them, train them, give them the tools and they will get the job done. But also in today's marketplace, trauma is very, very significant. And we need to address the issue of trauma in our society because we got young people shooting and killing each other at an alarming rate. And the way in which EMS is being able to respond has made a difference. But I think that those are some of the steps that I would say. And I, as we close, for me in particular, Mr. Phil Hallen got involved in EMS over 50 years ago in 1970 and into the early 60s. And here we are now in the year 2020. Uh, it's really special. And Phil, again, I take my hat off to you, my friend, because you know how strongly I felt about you and the sense of establishing the foundation from Freedom House to what's going on in our society today. Thank you, Councilman. And next up on my screen is uh, Mr. Allen. Uh, well, first of all, I feel like the, uh, the, uh, the, the proudest uh, grandfather in the world, listening to all of this uh, unfold, see how this all played out uh, in my lifetime. Uh, I'm still around to see the uh, results of this. Uh, one thing I was just struck with was uh, uh, in terms of uh, future recruiting and, ed and education and, uh, and the uh, changing of a culture within the younger African-American community to look at these uh, uh, pa pathways to various medical careers, many times beginning with uh, EMS training is, uh, is Dr. O's uh, uh, efforts to kind of revise uh, the, uh, the film, uh, the, to, to create new and up-to-date tools in the form of a documentary film, which he's working on, uh, to address this, these very issues, to uh, uh, be able to move out into uh, high school, junior high school communities, and uh, let young people know that there are these opportunities out there. I think that's the most, uh, uh, the, that's a critical pathway, and, and everybody is on the same uh, sidewalk here, I think. Uh, uh, it's extremely encouraging to see this happening. And I uh, can only say that you all are doing a, an outstanding job of picking up the threads and uh, weaving them into the new fabric that we have uh, at the current time, which is in many ways much more uh, complex racially than it was uh, in, the, in the 50s and 60s when, sure, you had overt discrimination. You could see it happening. Now, the racism we have is invisible, uh, except when we have uh, police brutality and, and, uh, and uh, violence and gun violence. The, beyond those visible signs, you have the hidden uh, racism that's just uh, built in and inherent in so much of the population. Um, so you have to keep that in mind as at, at, the, at the base of this, but never mind all that. Just get on with figuring out how to get kids into these tracks, figuring out how to get kids uh, motivated, let them see uh, a, uh, the American Gilchrist story. We talked yesterday in talking about this film, who are the superheroes for these young people now? Uh, the superheroes are, uh, the uh, the Gilchrists of the world and some of the EMTs that uh, are currently working. These are the people uh, who are closer to their own age and so on, rather than uh, old gray heads. Well, Mitch is not exactly a gray head. He, if he had hair, he would be gray. But um, uh, these are these are the 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 the, uh, the icons of the past, the John Lewises in a sense. Uh, but it's time for uh, the, uh, the the activists in curricular develop uh, development to uh, be front and center, and I think this 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 exercise today and the efforts that are going on certainly uh, are, are so encouraging to me. I'm just delighted to see this this new push forward, and I thank everybody for uh, 
uh, having me come on and getting me out of mothballs and um, <laughs> and uh, coming back. So thanks. Thank you so much for that, Phil. Um, and Mr. Moon. Um, echoing on what Councilman Brown mentioned earlier, uh, we do have to consider the past. And when he said that, I couldn't help but go back to uh, when the city of Pittsburgh's EMS system first began. Um, you had individuals that experienced culture shock. So they came into the city with an entirely different mentality. Uh, it was one of fear. It was one of uh, concern. And, and as a result of that, um, the department started stereotyping various communities, uh, primarily the African-American communities, uh, with certain different types of uh, labels, such as if you wanted um a traumatic event or a shooting or a drug overdose or what have you uh those would only occur in say the hill district or homewood or manchester uh if you wanted a stroke or a diabetic or a heart attack uh maybe you'd be best assigned to a unit that was uh, in squirrel hill or brookline or beachview uh so along the way those were some of the different types of stereotype attitudes that had to change as a result of that. Uh, the department as a whole was issued seven cell flashlights, primarily uh, the type that the police carry, uh, more or less as a protective me mechanism to uh, protect themselves against unwanted uh, aggression. None of that actually happened, but it was just an eye-opening experience for me to the point that uh, we have to elevate our mind to a different perspective. We have to uh, look at how we want to make this change. And we've all come up with fantastic ideas. Uh, we just have to implement them uh, because if we don't, uh, you're going to have, like you mentioned earlier, the overt systemic racism continuing to go on. So I think we have to take a leadership role in that. And I'm very much appreciative to this panel for your ideas and your goals. And um, I'm at your beck and call. Thank you so much, Mr. Moon. I'm so happy you were here. Um, Dr. Tripp, last comments. Sure, thank you. Um, I just wanted to say um, that I definitely am looking forward to keeping this conversation, you know, continuing and engaging. And I think that one of the things I have found, especially in my new position of looking at all of these diversity, equity, and inclusion efforts is keeping that momentum. And so I do want to, you know, definitely um, truly thank and honor those that have really made the path for myself. So thank you very much, you know, Councilman Brown, uh, Phil Hallen, you know, and then also John Moon, um, Chief Moon. And, you know, and even when I talk with Amara, um, for definitely for me as a as a African American woman in EMS and in emergency medicine, that you know when I'm coming onto the streets and I'm dealing with our paramedics and with our EMTs, you know having them seeing a person in a leadership um, position, it really is eliciting that someone is caring and that we are having moving towards progress. So I just wanted to you know definitely thank all of you to continue keeping that momentum and that progress and really enlightening us to make sure that. When we're looking at our history, we appreciate our history, we acknowledge it, and that we're going to make new history. Excellent. Thank you so much, Dr. Tripp. Chief Gilchrist. Um, one of the things that came to mind as we were talking, and I just wanted to, you know, leave this as closing. So mentorship. Um, John Moon was a instrumental in, like I said, to where I'm at now. Um, and he mentored me all the way up till the time he left. Just as it, it, it sounds like um, Mr. Brown, you mentored him and somebody did that before you. Um, it's important for us, people of color, it, it doesn't even matter, to mentor the younger generation and to let them know that there is more out there. Um, 
I don't, I don't know. It's it, it, networking is just so important. I look so forward to working with you, uh, Ricky and Dr. O, just on some of the endeavors that we have been talking about offline, um, because I think that'll get the ball rolling and it'll get more people interested in this field. But I will take a cue from you, Mr. Moon, and I will do the things that you did to interest people in this field and to keep them engaged. And um, just, it, it was the little things that you did that made a difference. I mean, going out to the field and it's like you were a high boss and here we are paramedics and it's like you would come in and the sun would just start shining. And it was like, those are the things that we look forward to. And those are, that, that is one of the things that propelled me to want to have on a white shirt, you know, because it was just like, wow, I mean, he's so nice. He's making a difference. And I really would like to think I'm doing the same thing. So, I mean, you're a tough act to follow, but you know, I'm trying, I'm trying, but I think. Faith and confidence. <laughs> so I, I think networking, le leadership, and just mentoring is, you know, our responsibility to get more um, young people of color and more minorities just involved in this. But thanks for having me. And, you know, I look forward to seeing all of you soon. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Uh, Mr. Story. Well, first, thanks uh, for allowing me to take part in this. And it's been uh, a great pleasure to uh, hear all the stories from everyone else and all the positions. For me, when I teach things educationally, I talk about the four components of education, students, instructors, curriculum, and environment. And I think that, you know, Pittsburgh and has a long history of uh, great efforts, particularly with the environment and, and the curriculum. And we've evolved many outstanding instructor level individuals and have students that have come through our doors. For me, for the future, I think we've got to look for the future the way that the hopefully those of us that are old enough to know the history of the past uh, can help uh, facilitate things. So uh, 66, 67, the, the birthing of Freedom House, part of that didn't exist. It was a new event uh, that over the decades since then, many new things have emerged in the healthcare arena. I keep trying to find the right individuals to work with to say, I think we need to create yet another new practitioner that doesn't exist yet. Perhaps it's something that Dan was talking about that uh, they're gonna spin off ConnectWise, but like Mitch talking about, we need to take care of trauma. So we need individuals that are trained on uh, stop the bleed, uh, how to administer Narcan, how to do CPR, and uh, a few other events that can easily be achieved in a short curriculum and train the nation. Um, I think we can use as a foundation, perhaps EMT level training, maybe advanced EMT, but they don't have to become necessarily paramedics, but create this new practitioner that the University of Pittsburgh perhaps should help facilitate uh, and have this practitioner be the one that goes out and provides the new level of what we need to do in healthcare. The university for years now has tried to do things with community health centers. And that's an area I think that we need to pay more attention to and spend more time with. We need to take what we do healthcare wise to where the individuals are. We need to take it to their homes. We need to take it to their communities and we need to educate the individuals then that are going to provide that care there with the appropriate knowledge, skills and equipment to be able to take care of it. And I would hope that if we do that in this next decade, uh, that 40 years from now, then we can have another group of folks talk about those people from the past who established something new that was creative, uh, just like Freedom House was, and just like anything else was, that they recognized the need for having this new level of healthcare, new practitioner, new individuals to do it, and that the university get the recognition and uh, as being the institution that helps support and make that happen. Thank you, Thanks Dr. for allowing Stewart. me to uh, play. Thank you for being here. Dr. O. All right, I know we're pressed for time. I have one word, superhero. Everybody who's on this call is a superhero and it is our job to raise the next generation of superheroes. Every superhero has an imperfection. Every superhero had to um, overcome an obstacle or some kind of obstacle. And so it is our job to now raise the next generation of superheroes, both with the old and the new. And in, in, in the era of COVID, 
we are now truly recognized as the superheroes like never before, those of us who are providing health to our community. And I agree with Dr. Stoy, let us not forget about our families. Let us integrate the parents, the caregivers, the grandparents, all of the community as we raise uh, our children to be superheroes. Excellent, Dr. O. And yes, we are at that be bewitching hour. However, uh, I'm gonna take uh, just liberty if folks want to stay and just ask the folks who we'll stick around for three more minutes so I can give uh, Mr. S uh, Dr. Swayze and, and Mrs. Davis an opportunity to have a closing uh, word or two. I'll just echo what I said earlier and what's been said. You know, the, uh, the folks directly affiliated with Freedom House just know that your legacy continues. I think in how we look at creating the future of EMS is going to be largely dependent on the lessons that you all taught us. And I think it's incumbent on us to pay close attention and to Sylvia, Ricky and Amara, you all are the, the shoulders that we plan on standing on in the future. And, and it's a role that you may not have planned on playing in your careers, but it's a role that you've inherited. Uh, and I'm, I'm looking forward to working with all of you as we try to figure out what we can do to continue the legacy that the Freedom House guys have helped create for us. Thank you, Dan. Future Dr. Davis. Thank you, Mario. First, I'd like to say um, thank you to, uh, to Mr. Moon uh, and to Phil Hallen. Um, I met Mr. Moon almost 30 years ago when Bob Conemacher brought you to our summer pre-medical academic program, and he brought you every summer to talk to the students about Freedom House. And uh, Ricky Tripp was one of those students. So um, I'm hoping that that's where that seed was planted during the summer program. Um, and to Phil for being a partner for all these years, uh, where we are even today, without Phil's knack for partnership um, and for helping us to know where to look for funds and how to put programs together. So thank you to Phil. Uh, but my, my final word uh, for today is excited. I'm just, I'm so, so encouraged and excited to see the, the leadership that we have working on these issues right now. Dr. Wusa Ansa, Dr. Tripp, uh, Chief Gilchrist, um, Antonio, and, and on the participant roster, uh, Mohammed Hagamed, who I'm just so thrilled is, is back in the city to see what you're gonna do um, in terms of moving these issues forward um, and EMS instruction into our communities through the university's community engagement centers so that we can, we can grow another crop um, and, and solve some of the issues that we're looking at today. So I'm excited. Excellent, thank you so much. I just want to thank uh, Mario, Antonio. Mario, can I just? Uh, can I just oh, speak? yes. Okay. Doctor, yes, Mr. Be before you thank us, I want to uh, thank you uh, for your excellent uh, moderating of this panel. Uh, in spite of uh, the background that you're in, the, the, the sylvan background that you're in front of, you're a very practical guy and you know how to do this. And it's, it's, it's great to be able to work with you. And I think we all appreciate your, um, your moderating of this panel. The other person that, that is sort of not any, anywhere uh, visible at the moment is uh, Antonio Gamacho. And uh, he's really the architect of this uh, whole venture. He, can, he got people uh, thinking about it. He got people, uh, he, he scratched around enough to find uh, where everybody was hiding out in their own silo and um, uh, brought everybody together. And uh, he deserves a great, a great deal of credit as well. So thanks for him. Yes, indeed. Thank you so much for that, Phil. Thank you. And, and absolutely right. Uh, thank you, Antonio for inviting me and allowing me to participate in this. This has been the highlight of not my week, but my month. Uh, so thank you all. And I still go into barbershops, Phil. Uh, so if anyone wants to come with me into the barbershops, I would love to just take you all in there with me and let's go, I don't know, get a haircut and just hang out. <laughs> Big time. Thank you so much. Thank you to our audience for sticking around with us. Have a great day, everybody. Keep doing the work. Thank you.